Now, after we have the basic understanding of the three uh, testing protocols or the three types of analysis of the OCT in glaucoma, these are the types of scans that we actually get. So the first over here is the RNFL or the optic nerve head analysis protocol. And the second over here is the macular cube or the macular protocol. Now let us see what are the components of the scan and how to read the scan very easily. Now let us start re by reading a printout of an OCT which is showing the RNFL and the ONH analysis. The first point that we see is actually the patient data. The patient information or the patient data consists of the name of the patient, the age of the patient, the sex, examination date, time, date of birth and the registration number. All this is very important and it needs to be fed correctly in the machine once because it can be used later for correlation with the further um, printouts of the patient so that we can find out whether the glaucomatous defect is actually progressing or not. Therefore, patient data is very important. Another point in patient data is the refraction of the patient, which is also very, very important, specifically in case of myopes. In case of myopic patient, as I already told you that the posterior segment is not normal. They usually have different morphology of the optic nerve head compared to the normal individuals. They might be having a temporal crescent, a temporal shifting of the retina, a tilted disc. All this will actually prevent us from using the normal normative data for such patients. Therefore, in case of myopes, it might not be so useful to do an RF, RNFL or an optic nerve head scan and we might have to rely on the macular scan. Therefore, the patient data is very important, especially the refraction of the patient. Now, the next parameter that we have to consider is actually the signal strength. The signal strength is given by the manufacturer of the machine and it is very important to assess the quality of the image. If the quality of the image is good, only then we actually proceed with the further steps of reading the OCT printout. The signal strength in case of a cirrus uh, standard domain uh, OCT is usually more than 6, whereas in case of spectralis, it is taken to be more than 15. In Avanti, it is taken to be more than 30. So the signal strength should always be assessed before we start reading the um, uh, printout of an OCT. The next component of the OCT printout is actually the RNFL thickness map. It is not, nothing but the tomographic map taken over the RNFL, uh, the RNFL cube that we actually measured and it will tell about the thickness around that cube. Normally the thickness uh, will actually be in an hourglass or a butterfly wing shape and this butterfly wing or the hourglass will be usually red in color or yellow in color which means that it is of normal thickness right now this thickness maps helps us to detect the asymmetry between the superior quadrant and the inferior quadrant and also can detect early peripheral defects now the peripheral defects will either look blue in bluish in color or they will look like greenish in color and sometimes we will also have a blackish defect also therefore such blue notches if present in between these normal reddish or yellow butterfly shaped structure will indicate the early peripheral defects the next component of the OCT printout is the RNFL deviation maps which are shown over here in red cube. So these are the RNFL deviation maps of the two eyes. Now in the normal retinal thickness maps we were actually getting the absolute thickness of the RNFL of the patient. When the absolute values of the RNFL thickness are compared with the patients of similar age. So what I mean to say is whenever we are comparing the thickness of RNFL with the age match controls uh, in the normative data present in the machine that deviation is represented in the RNFL deviation. So RNFL deviation maps will tell us how much the uh, thickness of RNFL of the patient or how much the RNFL thickness of the patient actually deviate from a normal individual. And that deviation will again be represented by giving different types of color coding. That is green, which is normal. That is 95% of the normal individuals will actually be having that RNFL thickness. Yellow means that only 5% of the normal population will have that particular RNFL thickness and red actually means that it is the danger zone that means only 1% of the normal population will have that type of RNFL thickness. 
Now, as can be seen in this diagram, this was initially the RNFL thickness of the patient. And I told you that the color coding of the tomograph or the RNFL thickness map is totally opposite to that of the deviation map. In the RNFL thickness map, red actually indicates that a good thickness of RNFL is present. Over here in this diagram, the RNFL thickness is actually represented in blue color. That means there is some sort of thinning and inferiorly there is no redness present. It is entirely blue. And the same thing can be represented in this RNFL deviation map. And we can see that here is a huge red color area and red color area actually indicates that there is a defect. Okay, so it indicates that this deviation is present only in 1% of the normal population and therefore it is dangerous. So this was about the RNFL deviation maps. Now, the next component of the OCT is actually the RNFL thickness uh, graph, that is the TISNET graph. Whenever we represent the RNFL thickness, which we measured around the peripapillary area by doing serial A scans, we can represent that thickness actually in the form of this TISNET map. Right. So if you remember from my previous video around the optic disc, OK, at a 3.45 millimeter circle diameter circle, we were measuring the peripapillary RNFL thickness starting from the temporal area going to superior and then going to nasal and finally inferior. So a circle of measurement was done. This circle of measurement will be represented along a graph and that graph is called a TISNET graph as shown over here. The green zone actually indicates the normal zone. The yellow is the borderline and red is the dangerous zone. The dotted line will indicate the thickness of one eye and the other eye will be represented in the, in the uh, total line. Right. So we have to see and follow this graph and see if there's any dips present in this graph to the red zone or to the yellow zone. So the TISNET map is actually used to detect a localized notch or localized defect or sometimes there might be a greater RNFL loss and we might see an extensive flattening also. In this patient, we saw that the RNFL deviation map was abnormal in the inferior sector. And the same thing can be seen in this TISNET map also that if you actually follow this dotted line, this dotted line is dipping into the red zone in the nasal and inferior part of the peripapillary RNFL representation. Very similar to the TISNET graph of the RNFL thickness, we have a TISNET graph of the neuroretinal rim, right, which is represented in this red box. The TISNET graph of the neuroretinal rim will actually measure the thickness of the NRR or the neuroretinal rim and this measurement would actually be taken along the opening of the Brux membrane that is considering the Brux membrane opening. Now the difference between this and the RNFL thickness was is that the RNFL thickness is measured along a circle of 3.45 diameters around the disc and it actually takes the peripapillary measurement by uh, taking a circular area. However, the neuroretinal thickness is measured from the Brux membrane opening that is the ending of the Brux membrane and considering it as a disc and then measuring the internal limiting membrane and the distance between them will be taken as the rim width right so based on that the neuroretinal rim calculation will be done and from this graph we can actually find out if there's any uh, localized notch or any extensive notch present in the patient so that's the purpose of the TISNET graph of the neuroretinal rim. This component of the OCT are actually the RNFL quadrant or the clock hour maps, right? So as you can see the circle, the circle is actually divided into four quadrants, superior, inferior, temporal and nasal. So these are the four quadrants and the color coding is similar to that of the TISNET map. That is red means that there is a danger zone. That means the RNFL is very thinned out in that area. Yellow is a borderline and uh, the the uh, Green color is actually the normal RNFL thickness. Similarly, we have the clock hour representation also in which the circle will be divided into 12 clock hours and each clock hour we will have the RNFL thickness represented. So after the uh, RNFL thickness maps have been calculated and the neuroretinal thickness maps have been calculated, the quadrant and the clock hour maps also have been given. Finally, we will get what is no meant by the key parameters or what is called key parameters. So this table over here represents the key parameters that we usually get uh, from the OCT scan uh, 
to having the RNFL and the optic nerve head analysis protocol. So the key parameter that we get is the average uh, retinal nerve fiber layer thickness. We get the RNFL symmetry, the rim area, the average cup disc ratio, the vertical cup disc ratio, the cup volume, right? So normally the RNFL symmetry will be about 76% to 95% and the average RNFL thickness is from about 75 to 107.2. Similarly, uh, in this, uh, this picture, these tables over here are actually showing the normal RNFL thickness value in each quadrant and in each clock hours. Now, as you can see in this patient, the average RNFL thickness of this patient is about 61 micrometers. Now, this is much less compared to the normal range that is about 75 and therefore it is represented in red color. Similarly, the RNFL symmetry also if you see, which means that the superior and inferior RNFL, how much similar they are, right? So, similarity between them is only 55%. However, normally we know that it, it can be from 76% to 95%. 5%. So again, it is represented in red color. Similarly, the area of the rim also, you know, which should be about 1.015 to 1.6. In this person, it is only about 0 0.70 in the left eye. And therefore, this is also represented in the red color. Okay, next is the average CD ratio. We know that the CD ratio also over here is about 0.7 and therefore it is increased. And similarly, the vertical CD ratio is also increased and that is the reason it is all represented in red color in the OCT. Now, the ninth component that we check on the OCT is the extracted horizontal and the vertical B scans, right, which are shown over here. The B scan, the machine actually does B scan to actually locate what is the boundary of the cup and what is the boundary of the disc, which I have explained to you in the basics of the OCT, right? So, it first determines where is the uh, RP ending or where is the Brux membrane ending and that is taken to be the boundary of the disc. And from there, it calculates where exactly is the internal limiting membrane right so the correct for the correct localization the machine actually does this b scans both in the vertical direction of the disc and then in the horizontal direction of the disc right and these are called the extracted horizontal and the vertical b scans The final or the 10th component of the OCT printout is actually the RNFL calculation circle or the circular B scan which is shown over here. It's a very important and a reliable criteria to determine whether centration is good or not and it tells about the segmentation of the retinal layers by the software, right? So if the segmentation is good and if the centration is good, we will actually get a good circular B scan which is shown over here. Just like for assessing the quality of the OCT, the signal strength was very important. Similarly, to assess the segmentation of the retinal layers has been done properly or not, the evaluation of the circular B scan is also very important. So this circular B scan helps us to search for errors of segmentation or for localized signal loss despite good, good signal strength, right? So sometimes what happens is we might actually have areas where the OCT might not have detected or given us our, our path parameters at those locations. But we might actually find that the signal strength is good, right? So in those cases, it might be happening because of the segmentation problem. And in those cases, the circular B scan will be abnormal. And we will know that, okay, fine, here we were actually dealing with an algorithm failure and we might have to repeat our OCT. Now let us read out a printout in which the macular analysis is actually being done. In the macular analysis printout also, first we will consider the patient data. Then we are going to look at the signal strength, which should be at least more than 5 in Cirrus, more than 15 and more than 30 in Spectralis and Avanti respective, uh, respectively. Next, what we consider is the thickness maps, right? So just like the RNFL thickness map, we also have thickness map, which are actually telling us about the thickness of the ganglion cell complex, okay? And it will have the similar type of color coding because it is a tomogram of the macular area. So the red and the yellow color will actually indicate that the thickness is normal. However, wherever we see these blue zones in between this red color areas, it will indicate that there is a thinning of the ganglion cell complex in that area. So early lesions can be more marked 
and in they can be more uh, markedly present in the temporal area now i have already told you in my previous video on the basics of oct as to why the inferior temporal quadrants are involved first uh, or in earlier in the glaucoma right because they are going into the part of the neuroretinal rim which uh, actually forms the inferior vulnerable zone after calculating the thickness of the macular area and representing them in the macular thickness map now we will be actually comparing it with the normal population and when we do that we will get a map which is called the deviation maps or the macular thickness deviation maps so just like the rnfl deviation maps their color coding is totally different to the the thickness maps so in this type what happens is when we see a red zone it means that it is present in population less than one person and therefore those are the dangerous zones right so in this example the thickness map was showing bluish in color right and in the deviation map we can see a reddish zone that means that this falls under the section of population in which only one person will have this type of thickness that means it is abnormal thickness or there is thinning which is present next what we have is actually the tables for parameters right so the tables will be represented in such pie charts like we have seen in rnfl in which every quadrant we can see what is exactly the thickness present and sometimes there might be special parameters also these special parameters in cirrus is the minimum gcl and in avanti we have the global uh, loss volume and the focal loss volume so what is meant by global loss volume and focal loss volume i will be telling you in the end of this video so these are the key parameters which are present and uh, after that what we have is the horizontal b scans right which are representing in this end of the print right so these horizontal b scans will actually confirm the quality of the segmentation of the ganglion cell layer and the inner plexiform layer by the software so by reading this horizontal b scans we can also get to know about any structural deformities or structural abnormalities present in the macular region which might have some effect on our macular scan right so we need to make sure that there is no defects like armd or some problems in the macula and they are not causing the problems in the thickness maps or in the uh, deviation maps so once we have a good uh, quality segmentation of the ganglion cells and the inner plexiform layers and we have a good signal strength then we can actually rely on this macular scan otherwise we have to take it with a pinch of salt now let us see what is meant by this focal loss volume percentage and the global loss volume percentage these are the special percentages or the special parameters which are calculated in the avanti oct or in the optoview oct right so the focal loss volume is more like the path uh, the path holes in the topography of the gcc that means the focal loss volume percentage actually measures the average amount of focal or the isolated losses over the entire gcc right so it is very similar to our corrected pattern standard deviation in our uh, visual fields right uh, similarly the global loss volume however is the overall thinning in the topography of the gcc that means very similar to the mean deviation which is seen in our visual fields so this if suppose this was our hill of vision and there are these defects over here like this okay these are the isolated defects so measurement of these isolated or focal defects you know will be done by the focal loss volume percentage however how much is the uh, thickness decrease from an average value that would be told by the global loss volume so suppose this was supposed to be the thickness of the macular or the gcc and now it has thinned out on an average from this point by this much units right so the percentage of this will give us the global loss volume so i hope this video was useful to you if it was share the knowledge thank you and have a nice day